Welcome back to WD FM, the official Walt Disney Family Museum podcast. We're your hosts, Bree Bertolaccini, Marketing Manager. And Chris Mullen, Senior Marketing and Communications Coordinator at the Walt Disney Family Museum. We are so excited to be back after a, a little hiatus. We're kicking it off with a brand new Museum Musings episode. First, for some museum updates. Open now through January 8th, 2023 in the Diane Disney Miller Exhibition Hall. See our newest major special exhibition, Walt Disney's The Jungle Book, Making a Masterpiece, guest curated by acclaimed animator and Disney legend, Andrea Stasia. Now, Bree, we haven't really had a chance to talk about this exhibition with our audience. Uh, What were some highlights of the exhibition for you? Yeah, I'm so excited. We finally get to talk about it. The Jungle Book exhibition is absolutely beautiful. We were both there for the opening uh, celebrations and just walking through that exhibition, there's so much beautiful artwork on display. You really feel like you're walking into the film and, you know, just that kind of sense of scenery from each chapter of each book is represented. And so from an art perspective, I love the concept art by Walt Paragoy. And that's kind of in the first section, you see kind of the early film developments and there are these expansive long concept art of Mowgli going through the colorful jungle. And they're really, really conceptual. Like, I mean, just big leaves, um, just, you know, kind of bigger concepts of trees in general. Um, and just like a little tiny Mowgli, but they convey a great color palette for the film and you get the right mysterious tone from them. But how could we not mention King Louis' throne that you can actually sit on? That throne looks like it just jumped right out of the film. Did you get a chance to sit on it, Chris? Well, if you didn't bring up the chair, I was. I did. I did. I love a good chair. Um, My favorite thing about the exhibition myself, outside of the wonderful chair, uh, is the section near the end about the film's merchandising and legacy. As I was not born around the release of the film, I know The Jungle Book through its legacy today. It's home video release, sequels, reboots, and reimaginings, and spinoffs, video games, its legendary songs featured on many Disney compilation CDs, uh, also through theme park attractions, shows, and the walk-around character meet and greets. It's also just so poignant that The Jungle Book inspired so many of the animators that went on to produce, direct, or supervise animation on many of the characters that we grew up with. Uh, Disney legend Don Hahn's drawing at age 16 after seeing the film himself is a really cool artifact to end the exhibit on. Yeah, at that very end of the exhibition, there is kind of a section there of animators who worked at Disney, really made an impact on Disney, who were inspired by The Jungle Book. When we were doing our happily, to kind of peek behind the curtain here, when we were doing our Happily Ever After series, we realized when we were asking questions, you know, what were you inspired by as a kid? So many animators of, uh, you know, kind of Andreas Deja, um, Don Hans kind of age, that kind of golden renaissance era of Disney. They all said the Jungle Book. And we were like, whoa, like what an interesting thing that like so many um, animators were inspired to pursue animation because of the Jungle Book. So we actually kind of carved out a little section um, to kind of highlight the fact that this was a really influential film on modern day animators. So I just thought that was interesting. Totally. And uh, Andreas Deja growing up in Germany and us finding out through his experience that The Jungle Book is the most highly attended film in German cinema history. Uh, that was such a fun little... Like still to this day. ...fact that we were able to find. To, to this day, the most highly attended movie to have been shown in German movie theaters is Walt Disney's The Jungle Book from 1967. That's incredible. Like forget Star Wars, forget even Titanic or Avatar. I mean, like some of these really top grossing American films that just couldn't couldn't hold a candle to Disney's uh, The Jungle Book. Couldn't hold a candle to or couldn't hold man's red flower. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's okay. Well, you can be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, you you're great at these puns. I I, you know, wish I wish I could do them myself. So you you're you're the pun master here. <laughs> Someone has to do it. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you can see Walt Disney's The Jungle Book making a masterpiece now through January 8th, 2023. And if you're not able to see the exhibition in person, we have our exhibition catalog uh, that is available in our museum store. You can purchase it by visiting waltdisney.org forward slash store to learn more. And now with the return of our museum musings, we are kicking off a brand new segment called Collections Clash. In this segment, Bree and I will have a topic and we'll each pick three objects in the museum and square off. And hopefully we won't pick the same objects. Our first topic is innovation. The more innovative the reasoning, the better. Bree, you go first. Okay, so for my first pick, I really, you know, tried to find a really colorful pick to to kick us off. Um, and I wanted to showcase the many ways that Walt Disney kind of pushed the art of filmmaking. So a highlight of our Silly Symphonies gallery, or what we call Gallery 3, is the case of paint jars. And that was used to add color to the animated films in short. And these paint jars helped to illustrate the talented female artists who carefully applied this vibrant color to each celluloid to bring the color to screen. Now, these jars also symbolize just the innovation of color. So innovation of color is my first pick. Um, so at the time, Walt was producing his cartoons in black and white, and he found that Technicolor had engineered a three-strip color process. He hadn't been super pleased with um, the previous uh, Technicolor process. It didn't really have the punchiness of the colors. So Walt negotiated an exclusive deal to use Technicolor's now three-strip process before any other studio. He won't really had the foresight to be an early adapter to color and have the most vibrant colors on screen, which he, he did. So he was about halfway through done animating flowers and trees in black and white and decided this short would be the perfect short to feature the new three strip color process Technicolor. So he actually redid the short in color and it ended up being the most beautiful short and it would go on to win the very first Academy Award for short subject cartoon. Today, this category is known as best animated short film. So fun fact, if you look closely at the paint jars in our galleries, you can find the jars labeled for Pluto's color for his fur and Donald's color for his beak. Wow, that is innovative. Um, I mean, they they created their own colors. It, like There were chemists in ink and paint that were devising just how to get these colors so right. Yeah, they weren't just painting and it wasn't just like ink by – I always think of um, the paint by numbers, uh, like those sheets. That It definitely was not that. There was an artistry. There was skill. Um, and there was chemistry. Like these women were, you know, devising new colors and new ways to, to mix the paint, to create their own paint. They really were pioneering something new. And it was women at the forefront of – this innovation as well. So Walt, Walt made a great deal, but it was really um, these women who brought the color to the screen. Very cool. Well, following on that technical uh, innovation uh, point, uh, now I promise not all of my picks will be related to what I'm currently streaming on Disney+, Plus. Uh, but my first pick is Optical Printer number 2, inspired by my current hyperfixation on the Light and Magic docuseries chronicling the rise of our down-the-street neighbors, Industrial Light and Magic. Now, before digital technology came into vogue, movie magic and live-action filmmaking was achieved through camera wizardry. How do you film things that don't exist in our world in a way that is believable to the audience? Well, one way is through optical printing, where you can composite multiple reels of film into the same shot. Disney's optical printer was created by inventor and animator extraordinaire Disney legend of iWorks. This device, which can be found in Gallery 9 past the Disneyland model, played a major role in Walt's innovative live-action films of the 1950s and 1960s and continued in earnest post-Walt. This device made it possible to seamlessly weave Peter Ellen Shaw's exquisite matte paintings into shots with real sets and live actors, split Haley Mills into two for the parent trap, and enabled Bert to dance with penguins in the famous chalk drawing scene in Mary Poppins, among many, many, many other classic scenes and films. The effects of the latter resulted in Walt Disney's only nomination for the Academy Award for Best Picture, something that we can definitely not only appreciate uh, Julie Andrews and Dick Van Dyke's performances in, uh, but of the skills of the artists and the technicians that really created just movie magic. 
And I will say the optical printer number two, people walk right past that thing in Gallery 9. Gallery 9 is packed so full of so many amazing things that people just don't stop to take a look at optical printer number two. And if you, you know, turn it on, Dick Van Dyke kind of pops up and he does this little dance and kind of explains what it is. But Honestly, the next time you visit the um, visit the Walt Disney Family Museum, please take a look at it. I didn't realize this until I think I'd been working for the museum for about four or five years that it is themed on the inside to be – I mean, they have a calendar up and I'm pretty sure um, it's around it's, – uh, the calendar is set to be like 1964. Like it's very, and it has the linoleum that was in the Walt Disney Studios at the time. Like the things on the walls are all themed to um, being at the Walt Disney Studios during this very specific period in time. So it is, it's really awesome to take a closer look at. I agree. But that's why it was my pick. <laughs> Well, for my second pick, I'm going with the Schulteis Notebook. It is my favorite thing to talk about, to be honest. Um, on display, we have Herman Schulteis's notebook where he documented the innovation and techniques used to create the visual effects in Pinocchio, Fantasia, and Dumbo. Um, and animation historian John Canemaker notes that this notebook is, quote, the Rosetta Stone of the animation. And it really is. Schulteis meticulously documented the process de detailing the tricks of the trade the notebook is filled with photographs, artworks, and detailed descriptions of how special effects were created at the studios. These notebooks document movie-making wizardry. Um, the Schulteis notebook is one of the many ways that we ensure that every guest visit is unique. So though behind the glass is an effort to conserve and protect the integrity of the pages, each month our collections team actually flips the page of the notebook. So every month you'll be able to see a new page of the notebook. The notebook has been entirely digitized so the visitors can explore, scan, and zoom through every single one of its pages, which matches each page's detailed processes with its finished product. So clips from the corresponding feature film showing the special effect in action. So you can leaf through the pages of the Golden Age of Disney Animation and Gallery 5. The artifact itself is really cool. But I like flipping through the digital version just because, you know, not only are you seeing just how they made these scenes, but it's along the margins of the screens. You can click and see the actual scene from the movie um, and see kind of side by side with how they did maybe the volcano exploding in Fantasia during Rite of Spring. And you can see just how they were able to accomplish that effect. So very cool just to spend a few minutes clicking on random pages and seeing what scenes from your favorite uh, golden age of Disney animation movies come up. For my next pick, it's actually right across from where the Schulteis Notebook lives uh, in Gallery 5. I'm going to be talking about the multiplane camera. Uh, one of three multiplane cameras still existing in the world. One at the museum, one at the Walt Disney Studios, and the other one at Walt Disney Studios Park at Disneyland Paris. The multiplane camera uh, was used first uh, in 1937's The Old Mill an Academy Award winning short, uh, and the multiplane camera itself won a special technical Academy Award as well. Uh, what made the multiplane camera such a technical achievement is that it was a giant rig that you had to climb a ladder up to operate, and you shot down from above, and from where the camera was down to the ground floor, uh, there were multiple planes that you could separate out the different elements of a scene, the background, the foreground, and the midground. And this allowed uh, Walt and his team to create the illusion of three-dimensional depth within their two-dimensional artwork. So it uh, premiered in 1937's The Old Mill. It was the very same year that Snow White and the Seven Dwarves released. Uh, and it would be uh, continually used on feature films and also short films, uh, throughout Disney history, all the way up until 1989's The Little Mermaid, very last film to use multiplane camera animation. Uh, by that point, the industry was trending towards digital technology, being able to create their films on computers. And with that next year's feature film, The Rescuers Down Under, they went entirely digital, making their movies using the CAPS system. Um, so... The multiplane camera was the state of the art 
of the industry in creating the illusion of three-dimensional depth from 1937 to 1989. What a run. Yeah, I guess, Chris, you just kind of win this whole thing. I think I should walk away now <laughs> because I think the, the multiplane camera is the big winner. I didn't want to take it for the first – for my first two picks, you know, kind of, I, I guess I just threw a little softball there and let you have it. <laughs> well, I play softball, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, and I mean, it's similar to your point about Technicolor. The multiplane camera was just such a leap forward that it really is synonymous with Disney innovation. Uh, and it changed the look of quality animated films for generations to come. It also separated Walt's films from anyone else doing animation at the time. So, I mean, it really is quintessential Walt Disney innovation. Yeah, definitely. And it's something I know that when guests walk through our galleries and even speaking to people who have visited the museum, I always hear so many people bring up the multiplane camera and how incredible it is to have it in our galleries and looking down on it from the second floor and then being able to get up close to it in our museum store. And every time I look at it, I always think like, wow, just having to operate this thing required so much patience. Uh, just to imagine all of the turning, of, there's five different levels. And sometimes on the most complex scenes, having those five different levels filled with something that's maybe a bird just kind of being animated in the background. There's somebody who has to just focus on all that animation just on that level. And maybe if that bird is flying downwards or upwards through the multiplane, um, it boggles my mind. Uh, <laughs> I know that I'm not the right person to have ever operated the multiplane camera because I don't have that kind of patience. But it is uh, really amazing to think about. For my last pick, it isn't exactly an object in the museum, but it is one you might have to step over while visiting the museum. So in our gallery, what we call Gallery 9, if you look down at the top of the gallery, you'll see a graphic interpretation of one of Walt's final projects, Epcot. So known today as a theme park, but Epcot was known as the experimental prototype community of tomorrow. And Walt had started making plans for a different way of building a community. He'd become really interested in the problems of modern day city planning, and he thought he could envision a new type of community. Now, I just think of this time period of like, you know, Walt's He's a filmmaker, but he's also a dreamer, and he had spent so much time developing Disneyland, and that had a level of community planning. And so it, it's just really interesting how he used that process of developing Disneyland, and it actually sparked something he really was interested in, which was urban planning. This innovation and innovative approach was – he was really trying to plan and build a place where people could live in an environment like no other. So Epcot was like the central core – would be the commercial center. And from there, it would have kind of strips of residences with kind of vast green spaces in between for kind of recreation and schools. And then supply trucks and other traffic would use underground tunnels. And there was the monorail and people mover as public transportation that would be available above ground. So Walt had really envisioned a city where research and development techniques would be presented. And, but the problem was that nothing of the sort had ever been tried. And this kind of innovative thinking wouldn't come to light in the original way that Walt had intended to, but it was implemented in many ways at Walt Disney World. So Magic Kingdom would be built on top of underground tunnels or utilidors. So the backstage elements of Magic Kingdom were hidden from view from guests. So it's actually Magic Kingdom's built on like a second story. So it's really interesting. During Walt's final months, with the intention of bringing Epcot to life, Reedy Creek Improvement District, a governmental body overseeing the 40 square miles of land, was created. And Reedy Creek is still in existence today that services the Walt Disney World Resort. Very interesting. Uh, I appreciate the selection of the Epcot representation um, because similar to the Schulteis Notebook, you really like picking things that people don't see. Um, it's it puts it in a way that you can uh, visualize that uh, Epcot wasn't just going to be a place that we had seen before that uh, based off of really how a city normally operates, uh, but would just be rethought literally from the ground up, uh, removing the emphasis on car travel for passengers, um, you know, using monorails and people movers to get around. 
um, and using in part the kind of radial spoke uh, design that Walt had used as the uh, centerpiece of the hub for uh, Main Street USA at Disneyland. So a lot of these things that Walt, like you said, was working on in creating Disneyland that maybe he hadn't originally thought of creating Disneyland um, came to be in his designs for Epcot. Uh, once he had done one, he then had the confidence to apply those same principles and techniques to creating a community, which is inspiring because as you said, he was a filmmaker and then he made theme parks and then he thought, well, I think I can make a city now, which is the kind of confidence that we should all aspire to have. <laughs> he really was interested in how people live and trying to make that easier and make communities more vibrant and using technology. And his his company, WED, now known as Walt Disney Imagineering, that was developing uh, technology for theme parks. I mean, it wasn't lost on him that that technology could be used in the real world and like monorails and people movers. There was already a monorail in Germany, um, but, you know, the development of people movers and just how public transportation obviously needed to move forward. And he actually had developed it in his theme parks and why not bring that to the real world? And so I can really appreciate that, um, that mindset. Of course, I totally agree. Well, continuing on innovation, uh, my last pick is Walt's skis in Gallery 3. Truly an innovative piece of winter sporting equipment. <laughs> no, just kidding. My... <laughs> Don't miss Walt's skis. Uh, my last pick might be a surprise to some, but it's an artifact that people may pass in our galleries because they're distracted by a different view. Uh, my last pick is the camera used in the True Life Adventure nature documentaries featured in Gallery 8, of which there's a show-stopping view of the Golden Gate Bridge just beyond it. Light and comedic, the True Life Adventure Pictures proved to a generation that documentaries could be successful and accessible to the general public. Walt won the most Academy Awards of any individual by innovating in different avenues of filmmaking. What a lot of people don't know is that Walt won eight Academy Awards alone from his True Life Adventures. Walt saw potential in the research footage shot for Bambi. He knew that there were stories about real animals that could be entertaining as well as educational. He contracted with Alfred and Elma Milat to shoot film in Alaska's Pribilof Islands, and he cut down the resulting footage into a 27-minute film that his distributor at the time, RKO Radio Pictures, initially refused to distribute. Who is telling Walt Disney uh, in the late 1940s that they're not going to distribute his movie? I don't know. Apparently, RKO Radio Pictures. <laughs> uh, after it won the Academy Award for Best Short Subject to Real, RKO agreed to distribute, but the lack of faith in that project led Walt and Roy to go about incorporating their very own in-house distribution company, Buena Vista, which, come to think of it, another innovation, a twofer. Wow, you just backdoored that, uh, that, second, uh, that second innovation in there. <laughs> That's sneaky. Well, I had to make sure I won. <laughs> well, you did take the multi-plane camera, and most of mine are very abstract. Well, it's, it's okay. We'll let the people decide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, to kind of sum it up, um, my to you know for my picks, I've chose the innovation of color, the Schulteis notebook, and Epcot. And I picked the optical printer, the multi-plane camera, and. Walt's skis, no, uh, and the True Life Adventure camera. Yeah, those are some pretty great innovations. So um, that was a great first uh, collections clash. So visit our Instagram stories today to vote on your favorite objects or email us at podcast at wdfmuseum.org to submit your vote for who won today's collections clash. And that brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you for tuning in to WD. FM, the official Walt Disney Family Museum podcast. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at WDF Museum for all the latest updates. From both of us, keep innovating and keep moving forward. Bye. See ya. <laughs>